Welcome to this final sermon in the series, God Is. Imagine that you were asked to give a speech, a lecture on the meaning of life or the nature of reality, or maybe the most significant thing you've learned in your life. Now imagine the person who asked you to give this talk, this lecture, said you only had about 15 minutes to do it. That would be difficult. How do you explain the meaning of life, the, the meaning of reality, even the most significant thing in your own life in just a short period of time? It's like the uh, speaker who said that, uh, you know, if you want me to speak for 15 minutes, then I need a week to prepare. If you need me to speak for 40 minutes, give me a couple of days. If you'd like me to speak for two hours, I'm ready to go right now. The idea is that somehow trying to capture all the important ideas under one big heading, like the meaning of life or the meaning of existence, or even what's most significant, is so difficult to do. In fact, you spend 95% of your time deciding what you're not going to talk about on the way to deciding what you do want to talk about. That's the way I feel about today's topic, the topic of love. God is love. There are so many things I would like to say about this subject. In fact, it's the very reason I attend Real Life Church. It's the very reason I'm a Christian. If for some reason they said, you know, this whole Jesus thing is not about love, or God is not love, or you shouldn't live a loving life, then I would check out of this Christianity gig. For me, the very core of understanding who God is is to think about God as love. So for today's sermon, I've got tried, well, I, I probably won't do it, but I've tried to get rid of all kinds of important topics and try to focus just on a few things I would like to share. Now, on a sermon about love, God is love, there are lots of texts in Scripture from which I could choose, Old Testament and New Testament what Jesus said, what great people said. But the ones that many people gravitate toward are the passages of Scripture that explicitly say, God is love. And we find two such sentences in 1 John chapter 4. Let's look at those to begin uh, our discussion. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. The second verse, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. These two passages of verses that say God is love are both talking about how God loves us and how we ought to love one another. If I was to work through all the passages in this particular fourth chapter of 1 John, there are so many excellent insights. In fact, this particular passage really serves as a center for the way people in our church, in our denomination, in our tradition have tried to understand God. Perhaps you know this, but one of the most important thinkers in our kind of tradition, theological tradition, is a guy named John Wesley. And to prepare for this particular talk, I thought, well, I wonder what John Wesley says about these verses. Actually, I already knew, but I thought it would be great to share with you. Because I like the way John Wesley emphasizes the primacy, the priority 
of love when it comes to God. Here are his words from his explanatory notes on the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4. Wesley writes this, God is often styled, thought of, as holy, righteous, wise, but not as holiness, righteousness, or wisdom in the abstract. God is said to be love, intimating that this is God's darling, his reigning attribute, the attribute that sheds an amiable glory on all his other perfections. Christians in the theological tradition of the Wesleyan understanding of life, the Church of the Nazarene being one of them, have often said, if we want to understand God, we should start with, God is love. Now by that, many people have, I should say, many people have understood that, translated that, interpreted that phrase, God is love in a variety of ways. But Wesley seems to think that we should interpret the phrase as saying, love is God's primary or darling or reigning attribute. And we should understand God's other attributes, God other capacities, abilities, God's other ways of being in the light of love. Perhaps the most famous understanding of how we think about God in the light of love is how folks in our tradition have thought about God's power. The Wesleyan tradition thinks God is almighty, but they also think that creatures have freedom or agency, and God doesn't control everyone and everything. And Wesleyans do that, not only because that's the way they read scripture, but it's the way they understand a God of love, that love doesn't control everyone and everything, but gives freedom, agency, some kind of auton autonomy to creation. God is love means that we should understand God first as a God of love. I find this to be so important as I talk to people about how they think about God. You see, most people that I run into tend to think of God as a punisher or a dictator or someone who just every once in a while checks out, goes off on holiday and leaves us all off to ourselves. Sometimes people think God is so holy, so pure, so righteous that God would want nothing to do with you and me, you know, sinners, folks who have actual problems. But if we begin by thinking that God is a God of love, and that's how we should understand God's holiness, God's presence, God's power, God's knowledge, everything about God, that brings us to a view of God which says God is intimately acting for our well-being. God is intimately loving you and me and all creation. My first point then is that God is a God of love or God is love can mean God always loves everyone all the time because God's very nature is love or love is God's reigning attribute to use John Wesley's language. I find this helpful as a way to distinguish between the way you and I love and the way God loves. You see, as hard as I try to be a loving person, and that is at the very center of who I want to be, I'm not perfect. I screw up. Sometimes I'm just not loving. And by loving, I mean sometimes I just don't act for the well-being of others, of creation. Sometimes I don't act for my own well-being. Sometimes I'm not good to myself. I don't love perfectly, moment by moment. And yet God does. God's very nature is love. In fact, if God's nature is love, God must love. 
And I find that quite reassuring because it reassures me to think that God isn't sitting up in heaven or running around the world, or since I think God's omnipresent, God isn't deciding, hmm, should I love Tom today? Should I love Sarah today? Should I love ducks today? Should I love whoever, whatever? No, God loves you and me and all creation all the time because it's God's very nature to love. And that means, my second point, that God loves you and me despite the crap we've done, the ways we've screwed up, the sin that we've committed. But also, God loves us despite the things that have been done to us, the crap, the sin, the horrible things that sometimes other people do to us. You see, sometimes I don't feel worthy of love because I know I've screwed up. I've done something I'm ashamed of. Other times I don't feel worthy because someone has done something horrible to me and I feel shameful. To say God is love is to say that no matter what we've done or what other people who've done to us, God always acts for our well-being. God always works to heal, to forgive. God's not in the business of kicking your butt and punishing you left and right. God's in the business of forgiving, transforming, healing, not only healing your own decisions about how to live your life, but also how to deal with the trauma, the tragedy, the difficulties that others or just circumstances have given to you and me. Sometimes when we talk about God is love, and we say, as I've just said, that God loves you and me despite what we've done, we don't quite capture, I think, the kind of loving presence and activity God has for us in the sense of how God sees our own value, our own worth. In fact, sometimes Christians have gone around talking so much about how bad they are, how sinful they are, how depraved they are, that you get the sense that they're just going to hell in a handbasket, but God says, well, they're stinking, they're, they're, they're horrible, they're whatever, ah, but I'll love them anyway, even though they suck. No, God does love us when we suck, but... God also loves us because God sees us as valuable, as worthwhile, as made in God's own image, in fact, says scriptures. And because of that, God looks at us and sees in us some kind of intimate beauty and value that God desires, not only desires in and of itself, but desires to enhance this idea that God loves us deeply. In fact, God's very presence has been acting for our well-being even when we were in our mother's wombs. This is at the heart also of the way the Wesleyan tradition thinks about God. Let me put another quote up from John Wesley up here. Wesley writes this, We cannot love God until we know that God loves us. And then he quotes a passage also in 1 John, we love because he, meaning God, first loved us. He, Wesley goes on and says, and we cannot know God's love for us until his spirit witnesses to our spirit, the spirit itself bore witness to my spirit that I was a child of God, and I cried, Abba, Father, which is a way of talking about the intimacy, the intimate love of God for you and me. When Scripture talks about you and me being children of God, 
It's saying that we have this familial kind of relationship, that God has the kind of loving intimacy that comes from not only loving someone despite the crap they've done, but also because you and I have infinite value. God looks at you and I and sees not only what we're intrinsically capable of in the present, but what we someday could be. And this gets to my third, or maybe it's my fourth point. (laughs) God loves you because you have inherent value, because of your intrinsic beauty and incalculable worth. See, it's not an either or. Well, God loves you despite the fact you're a sinner. Or God loves you because God sees in you something valuable. God can love you simultaneously for both kinds of reasons. And finally, since my 15 minutes is coming to a close, finally, I think God seeks your well-being in a kind of loving friendship. This way of thinking about God has been particularly important to me in recent years. I've seen myself go through various stages in my life, sometimes being profoundly aware and even depressed about the difficulties, the sins, the struggles I've been through. Other times, feeling good about myself, seeing success, seeing excellence, and thinking, yeah, I'm on team God. God likes me because I'm made in God's image, and I've got something to give. Today, while I sometimes experience both those kinds of views of God's love for me, I have a deep sense of being God's companion, of being God's friend. You know that many people in Scripture, in the Old Testament and in the New, were called friends with God, and that the Apostle Paul says that God calls upon you and I to be collaborators, fellow workers, those who join with God in the work being done in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our world. In the mornings when I pray, I have a certain set of practices, but the most common one is one in which I say something to the effect of, God, you're my friend. I want to follow your guidance. Because I don't typically see God as a big king who's calling the shots, ordering me around like a little servant or a pawn. But neither do I see God as just sort of my personal butler who does everything I want done. No, in a real kind of friendship. In fact, from God's point of view, a perfect friendship because God loves me as a friend moment by moment and calls upon me and you to to have the kind of solidarity of action moving through our lives moment by moment in a friendship love relationship. God is love. God loves you and me despite what we've done and what others have done to us. God loves you and me and sees the value, the beauty, the inherent worth in each one of us, and in all creation. And God loves you and me as one who seeks a genuine friendship, a friendship that enhances our well-being, the well-being of others, and I think even God's own well-being. This morning, or whenever you're listening to this particular video, and you think about God is love. I hope you think about God in that kind of way.